I'm Maurice McDavid, host of Black, Brown, and Bilingue, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome, folks, to the official episode 99 of the High Tech Podcast. I'm a guy. Is it official? Because every time I talk about numbers, you are always quick to go, well, we did some interviews that weren't in the number stream. Uh, So this is it, folks. This is how we work. Your (laughs) hosts here, William Lingworth and Josh Swartz in our (laughs) usual form. You're right. You're right. This is episode like. I'm just saying. 104 technically. Whatever. It's fine. It's 99 for us. This is the labeled episode 99. Yeah. Uh, pretty excited. This is this is the end, coming to the end of season three. So next, no, this is the end of season three. It is the end of season three. It is not coming. It has arrived. <laughs> you know? Like now, I mean, like you could say it hasn't arrived until the end of this episode. So I guess... It's That's sort of true. coming. It's just, it's like, I think you meant it as like, you're on the iceberg and the Titanic was like a little <laughs> farther away, but like the Titanic is about to hit it, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah, like, I'm, that's, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to be on the iceberg though, looking at the Titanic coming at me. Cause that means I'm going to survive. I mean, I don't know. I'm on an iceberg, yeah. but well, we'll just see. don't go trying to get on whatever that door was that, uh, I don't even remember the there characters' names. Was, what was the... It was Jack and Jack whatever and... her name. Yeah. Uh, Jack and her. Yeah. <laughs> Jack and... Is it Jill? Jack's the one that... Jack... <laughs> Jack's <laughs> the one that died, and I can't remember the chica that, that lives. I'm not going to Google this. Why, I was about to Yeah, Google why are we Googling anyways? this? This is actually... Surprise! Season four of the High Tech Podcast will be totally Titanic-themed. Okay? I'm out. So... I'm out. You get yourself a new friggin' co-host. I'm out. <laughs> Nope. This, this broke, episode this broke us apart. <laughs> is um, just an investigation in, starting the topic up uh, about the community of inquiry. This is a research uh, area. It's a, a, a framework or a model for online education and, and um, what it looks like to actually create community in a virtual space. Um, it has implications in the physical classroom, I think, as well. It's not just limited to that. Uh, but ironically, I- I'm actually surprised we have not introduced this with Justin Harbin, Dr. Justin Harbin yeah. before this. He's probably this mentioned it. But I'm sure yeah. he has. I don't know. Like he was when I first got when you transitioned out of the job that that I was in and I came in, he was talking about it a lot. Like I remember it was like Right, 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 right. That was that was his thing. Um which that was now that I'm mentioning this, see we like talked about so we were gonna talk about this. That was was his doctorate was involved in these things, right? He used this as a, as one of his frameworks. Yes. That's and what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it was. He and I have actually presented on this in a couple of contexts, what Mikester learns and some things like that. Like he's presented on it himself and then I've helped him. I, I love it. I think it's very relevant. Um, we will give you listener a quick description and definition if you've never heard of this before, but the whole episode here is just going to be kind of bringing this up because um, I think it's really helpful and insightful f- as a teacher to think about, like, what are the things you should be thinking about when teaching? You know, we, we kind of know, most of us, hopefully, how to interact with students in a physical classroom. <laughs> we know there's exceptions to that. Some faculty aren't as sociable. Some students aren't as easy to talk to, right? But um, I like the ones that awkwardly laugh. Which you know? ones? The students or the faculty? <laughs> both. both. They're my favorite. Uh, that's it. But this, uh, this framework sets up um, some really intentional categories for you to bring into your instructional design to make sure you are reaching your students in human, uh, but also in effective ways. So here, here's the framework in a nutshell. It is a Venn diagram. I am not going to try and do any sort of visual description other than it's three circles overlapping in a Venn diagram. I will try in the video while Will describes it to make the Venn diagram with my hands. Wow. Okay. I, see, this is so, why you should watch the podcast, folks. Yes, this so is you why you should watch the video. Josh's yeah, exactly. hand dancing. Um, 
in no particular order, I'm just leading, reading it left to right from my screen, one of the areas of the community of inquiry is social presence. The next area is, he's doing it, cognitive <laughs> presence. The third <laughs> area, I'm, joking, I'm, doing it. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to do a pirouette. The third area is teaching presence. So if you heard that consistency there, folks, it's all about our presence, how we be, how we present ourselves or how we engage with each other yeah. in these spaces. Not the Social... gifts you get at Christmas. Correct. Yes. Although we'd love to give presents, that's, we, don't, we don't have any presents to give. Yeah. That's, that's anyway. really sorry. sorry. But I being present is, is fine. That's, that's is important yeah. is important in the classrooms so social presence i'm going to use garrison's direct words here and go for quotes on these just so we have everything on the board for you listener before we jump into the deep end. uh real quick we should probably mention before you go too far you mentioned his name but we didn't really mention the people right uh there are uh researchers involved with this right so get uh dr randy garrison dr yep, yep. marty marty Cle cleveland, cleveland. In is in is uh we probably should have worked on pronunciation pre, yeah. pre sorry uh, Mar dr marty yeah Wish we're working we on how to pronounce your entire uh, and then dr I norm vaughn vaughn yes indeed I'm those are the three on that one lead researchers who are at the website coi.athabascau.ca this is uh the athabasca university in canada is where dr garrison is from dr garrison's one of the lead and initial researchers um, I've actually been on this website for years and seen actually a few different names and things come up there. Dr. Vaughn's almost always been a part of this. Uh, he's had Dr. Uh, cool uh, participate in it. So, and that's cool with a K and an E, but like Pretty the cool. best last name ever. Yeah. Right. Um, but you can head there and find all those researchers, all the different participants, uh, ways that those folks have participated. In it. Dr. Garrison is the head and, and lead researcher. Um, yeah. Checking that. So Dr. Garrison in 2009, this was his quote here. Oh, there's Rourke and Archer, Anderson. There's, there's tons of names. We yeah. can't capture them all. There's a, it, there's a large team involved with it. Um, I think yeah. what we're looking at is just a couple of the main people who, who talk about it. So one of my first interactions with it was the paper that's, that's actually quoted on page here. If that, that cites Garrison, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. So when I think of it, I do think of those, those three Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. But Anderson and Archer aren't on the COI website anymore. I don't, you know, who knows what's changed in the research teams and if people aren't affiliated, anybody's retired, whatever. But that's who's behind this. Now, the thing that they're behind are the three presences. Pre pre presence I? Presences. Social presence is the ability of participants to identify with the community, right? It's about the social environment. Um, can they communicate in a trusting environment? Can they create interpersonal relationships? So can they bring their individual selves into a communal space, see themselves, see each other's, uh, be seen, see others, you know, that kind of thing. Social presence. Teaching presence is the design, facilitation, and direction of cognitive and social processes for the purpose of realizing personally meaningful and educationally worthwhile learning outcomes. Look, teachers speak for teaching presence is, have you designed it to accomplish the outcomes with the other stuff in mind? Cognitive process is the extent to which learners are able to construct and confirm meaning through sustained reflection and discourse. Social presence, how do the students interact with one another? Teaching presence, how does the teacher interact with the curriculum and with the students? Cognitive presence, how do we all intellectually engage with it, be, be stimulated by it, reflect on it, learn from it? These three presences together form the community of inquiry framework. Mm -hmm. Now, I will researchy and sciencey and, and, and big wordy this all night, but the reason I believe in this and why I wanted to emphasize this framework, and we'll talk about it, is that I've been in online education contexts. Most of my experience learning in online courses have not had this. At the most, they focus on cognitive presence. 
Um, in my in my um, K-12 experience, I was in cyber charter schools from the 5th to the 12th grade, 12th grades, plural, whatever. Um, all it was was like, read this, read this, watch this, take a quiz. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't have to talk to anybody. I didn't have a teacher. There was no real teacher involved. It was just cognitively engaged with the material. That was my entire k-12 experience except the first few years uh in college i've had similar things now in college there was definitely a teacher involved and those teachers yeah. usually showed up with like a weekly email something to that effect i took online courses at my undergrad and so i actually knew my online instructor from physical class which which helped make the connection and the social experience a little bit better um but that's that's it for me Pivoting it over to you for a second, Josh, in your online course experiences as a learner, have you had good experiences where either the social presence was emphasized, you engaged with your peers, you were present, and or the teaching presence was emphasized more than just like a weekly, here's what's to do email? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's it's tough because like my my online experience had a residency at one at some point, like most of my, my online okay. experience was grad. Um, yep. like yep. undergrad, I didn't, I didn't really take any online courses. I don't think in undergrad. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. We, that was back when we were using, uh, I mean, you'll remember this well, the, the old school, I mean, you're part of the team that helped transition it. Uh, the old school Moodle, Moodle. uh, yep. that like, listen, Moodle's got its, its stuff, but our institution was using the Moodle from the eighties. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I, there was a lot of online experience. I think if I take away the residency parts, from the course because they were not weekly they were like a focused time uh, in the course so i i always argue that my uh, my experience oh, in grad right, right. was like 97 percent online and like a hot second of not online so it was like, a weekend right like yeah friday well, this it was Sunday two or days it was usually during the week uh there oh, were okay. some weekends but they tried to avoid the weekends they were trying to do weekdays um so understandably i mean sometimes it would it would carry over into a saturday sometimes they do friday to saturday but um, yeah. that was like the most so at the online level a lot of it i think was engagement with content some of it was a professor but it was like feed there was more than just emails i mean there was feedback the professor would give feedback on your papers and what you were doing or what cool. you were submitting Good. um but not always like so there was always feedback whether i would count it as feedback is debatable like it's like some were really good they give a ton of feedback they'd they get into what you're writing um others were just like good job nailed it and then like you know that was it um and uh so i definitely think it was more engaged with content there was some engagement with other peers but there was not a lot of group work uh to be honest um in my grad right. experience uh, that was right. just the reality. Um, now, I think that's for a couple different reasons. I, as we know, doing group stuff online can be, it's a double-edged sword sometimes because like you want to have that engagement with participants. You want to have that social presence side, but um, it can be, it also can end up becoming like a cognitive load issue where like if it's too difficult to connect with people online or becomes a hassle, then it starts to get in the way of learning as opposed to, um helping it i think it sometimes right so right i'm not saying there shouldn't be that stuff in online i do think there should be it just needs to be carefully thought through and how you do it but anyway at the end of the day definitely i would agree with you that engagement with content is much was, more predominant in online learning um was yeah. top tier yeah yeah well and, and one of the things i think is interesting about what you experienced what you're talking about there i did um a few courses in that graduate school as well uh two or three and they had they were weekend residencies. I don't know what yeah. changed between me or you. It could be in our programs. Who knows? But like, yeah, but it also I went depended for on the course. Weekend. They did do some weekend right. ones, but like it depended on the schedule and the course and availability and stuff like that. So and it was it was really it was in some ways really awesome. I mean, we had concentrated on task time with each other um, to really dig into that social stuff to to get a lot of that teaching presence while being in the cognitive presence and oh it's like being in the classroom and so i think <laughs> weird they were planning that in these online programs because they they did value the social presence they valued the teaching presence and they felt like if we delivered this is me assuming right i wasn't part of these yeah. design conversations i know some of the designers who designed the courses but 
if we put them in these residencies, then we'll get those things that they miss in traditional online courses. My yeah. encouragement, the reason I bring up the COI, my experience, like I've been in courses that were socially rich. Um, yeah. I actually came out of some of my grad classes with friends, people I texted with, you know, like, and talked to LinkedIn and, and things like that, where, um, I, you know, uh, Josh, uh, I talked to, um, uh, you from undergrad. Like, I don't, I don't remember, I don't know who out of my undergrad I still talk to, but those social things that I, that I cultivated in that online, it, well, I guess it's you and, and Chris, Chris Cross. Like there's two people from undergrad. Yeah, I still know I still talk, talk to, to. Yeah. but like, that's not typical in graduate school. It's not, it's not typical in online, online courses as, at all. And so like something where a course is designed with a social presence in mind can really lead to those relationships that help learning. You know, we, yeah. we in my grad school um, were pretty well cohort based. And I had some of these people like for four and five and six classes, which was great. I enjoyed spending that time with them and getting to learn more yeah. about them and seeing, you know, all of us developing our skills together and, and seeing how we had changed from course to course. Um, that's where I think like having experienced some of those things in grad school that worked, that were evidences of this community of inquiry and practice, it makes it stand out to me all the more when it's not there. When you don't oh, yeah. know your peers, when you don't get to engage with them, when you don't have those mm -hmm. relationships. When you don't, you're missing one of these areas, I think, and there's a hyper focus on one. You suffer in some way, I think, in learning. Like there's there's going to be, I think that's why kind of the research behind what they're talking about is trying to encompass these three spheres. I think that's fair. I mean, like we won't... We won't belabor and pretend at this point, but like, I think, Will, you have more experience with this topic than I do, even though I was the one who I think I was just like, let's talk about this thing. Um, so like, in my experience, though, with these three different areas, like it's, I think you hurt missing any, any one of them um, right. or a hyper focus right. on one. And I think like, if we're just taking the technology side into what we talk about in high tech and we go to talk about online learning with this. In online learning, there tends to be a hyper focus on engagement with content. Um, right. I think the engagement with content and the lack of focus on teaching presence is why teachers don't like online learning. Like, let's just be real. There's a lot of instructors yeah. who don't, especially at the higher ed level. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with that they don't feel like they get to be present with the students. Now, as we've talked about in past episodes, there is a such thing as teacher presence in online learning. It's just different. Um, in a different component. And I do think we need to figure out a better way of coming up with the social presence side of this. We know um, that students, a lot of times, they don't just learn from the teacher, from the content, they learn from their discussions and their interactions with each other in the classroom. Right. And that helps foster new thoughts and new ideas. And I think a lot of times in online learning, and we're finding some people trying to do it creatively, but a lot of times in online learning, the default is uh, video, watch, write, do this thing. Oh, don't worry though. You have a discussion due on Wednesday um, yeah, where you get to post and have a lot of rich conversation with those whole two posts that you're required to send. Said no one um, ever. Said yes, no one ever. Like, I think there's a reason people hate discussions in online learning. Like if you talk, I think if I could pick, I'm just gonna say it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a hot take, okay? If I Go just randomly it. picked Shoot. instructional designers, okay? or SMEs, subject matter experts that help design online courses. And I say, what's one of your least favorite things in online courses? I bet money that one of the top two would be discussions. Like almost yep. everybody I talk to, they they put them in, but they hate the way we do discussions uh, yeah. because they don't it's foster the devil we know real too. discourse. Yeah. Right. Like it's, and at the end of the day, that's kind of, you need that. Um, uh, I like what they call it, kind of the way the content and uh, engagement with participants connects becomes the supporting discourse. We need more yeah. of that supporting discourse in online courses. We need to figure out a way to build that into our online environments a lot better to create better learning experiences. Like that's going to help build better learning experiences. Yeah, and I'm really happy you brought up that point about supporting discourse because folks as it is a venn diagram there's more areas that there's there's more information yeah. across Don't worry, these i'll try circles. to create them for you i will talk about it i can't wait this is great so we're in the supporting discourse uh yeah. section the supporting the discourse. remember there were two circles circle one circle two okay and where social they converge, presence 
cognitive <laughs> presence. If you have no idea what's going on right now, it's because you're not watching the video version. You should. This is a great time. I don't know what I look like right now, but it's stupid. Uh, I can tell it's you great. that. Okay. It's so perfect. Social presence, cognitive presence, and then where these two little guys meet. Right yep. here. What's that called, Will? Supporting discourse, like you brought yep. up. Um, it's it's this idea that if I just talk at people, they will hear the information. If I allow people to talk about the information, they will not only hear the information, but they will be processing it and trying to repeat it or um, express similar thoughts in new ways. That is supporting discourse. That is where not only am I taking the information in, but I'm taking it in, processing it, and trying to create, uh, produce. You know, there's processing and production. Um, and I think that that's really important. I know I'm really, I can speak quickly and think while I'm talking and get my thoughts together while we're working something out, but not everybody can do that. And so there's a value for both types of, of these learners where the person who like internally processes and can't speak out loud to get their thoughts together, that person, when the teacher is the only person speaking is only hearing that one voice and they are taking time to process everything that's being said all the time. Whereas that person who can speak quickly and, and can think out loud and can talk through their thoughts as they're forming and stuff like that, the external processor, they don't have the issue of like, you know, not being able to do two things at once or get it all together, but they get stuck in the fact of like, hey, the teacher is the only person talking and their own internal talk track can overtake them and it can distract them and they can get lost in it. Whereas if they have the opportunity for all of these things to meld, like the teacher speaks, people do listen, someone else speaks, we can change who's listening, someone else speaks, it moves around the room, that allows different types of learners to get the information and process it in different ways. I think this is a good thing. This is, this is what discourse is. I'm just describing a discussion in a classroom in a, in a real situation. Mm -hmm. We want that because it allows different learners to learn well. Yeah. But... A very important part of this, and it is now the next convergence of the social presence bubble and the teaching presence bubble, is the climate, right? So in the community of inquiry, they they phrase this as setting climate. I don't need to I don't need to like focus in that space. I just want to like I like to stay on this climate point because environment is very important to learning. And like what I was just discussing about discourse, right? If I'm one of those internal processors and my climate is unstable or my climate is being challenged, I, I might not be as able to keep up with the information. So it can be harder for people who are internal processors to handle fast discourse or loud discourse or frequent discourse. So that can impact the climate. And so the social presence that we need to start to establish to help with that climate is more comfort between our learners, especially across these internal and external processors, but even just that they're, they're comfortable with each other. They're not scared when someone speaks. They're not scared to ask for someone to repeat a question. Like some of those things, the comfortability with other people is social presence. Like I, you know, I don't necessarily just go up to a stranger and be like, dude, could you be quiet, please? Or dude, could you repeat yourself, please? Like, I'm not going to talk to a stranger that way. I, I ignore strangers. That is my, <laughs> that's my standard operating procedure for strangers. Ignore them. I mean, is um, that true? I, I think, I'd just like to add a, a, a brief aside on Will's operating procedure, okay? <laughs> um, ignore strangers unless they're holding bagels, okay? Like, that's <laughs> your, I'm just saying, your background seems to communicate okay. if they're holding bagels, then you'll talk to them. That's I mean, all... is that a bad principle? It's not, I'm not, listen, I'm not judging either way. I'm just saying if we're understanding the Will system, there's a few <laughs> caveats. It's all, it's all I'm saying. Anyway, sorry, shout out back to Justin to, Phillips, who I met yeah. over a bagel. Um, yes. Anyways, so in, in a social classroom, no, no, no. In, in a social classroom space, it's just like creating the right safe and secure space, a good environment for the learners to engage with each other, sets that climate. But the teacher is is a part of that, right? That's why there's this overlap. And I'm trying to show that it's it's it's. Mm -hmm. A Venn diagram for simplicity, but it's it all overlaps, right? If I have the right social climate, the discourse is going to be easier. But yeah. 
all this plays to the next overlap between the teaching presence circle and the cognitive presence circle, which is selecting the content. Content can, yep, Josh is doing the YMCA now. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Making visual Venn diagrams with your arms is very difficult. In case I, I love it. Frankly, okay. I think you should well, you should do more of this. One okay. of your one shots should be like a visual metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, I'm good. <laughs> you don't want to do modern dance for the podcast oh uh, no i thought about going into it but then i was like mm, you know it, 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 modern it, it, dance dead. anyway sorry dead. hey the connection between cognitive presence your engagement with the content and then teaching presence engagement with the, the goals the direction the instructor's engagement right and and that results in the content like the, the, the content both results in that and comes out of that. Like mm -hmm. if there's, if the content's not interesting, the climate's going to suck. People aren't interested. They're not motivated to engage. If the climate's not interesting, they're not going to want to talk about it. So, yeah. so there's of course the presences, the three presences that are critical to, to design into your classrooms, to try and cultivate. It doesn't have to be every second. It doesn't have to be the perfect 33, 33, 33 per percent ratio or something like that. But don't leave out social presence. Don't leave out teaching presence. Consider these things as well as cognitive presence because when they overlap and you do it well, boom, you have yeah. the unicorn classroom. I don't know if the it exists. The unicorn classroom. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the whole argument and the, the way the Venn diagram comes together is that when all three of these are coming together well, that's when they argue like a real educational experience is happening right is when yeah. these th these three things are being done in tandem and being cared for um and uh so i think to a certain extent we get that um i think the area that i think this is helpful is really helpful and interesting is what does this look like in online learning like how does community of inquiry impact online learning because that's i mean there's plenty of areas in the classroom we're not doing this well but like the area yeah. for sure i can say we're not doing this well is online learning we tend to struggle with encompassing these three spaces well together uh, yep. to a certain extent i think it's fair to say and if you feel like this is not a fair evaluation hit us up at inbox at high tech pod uh dot us or podcast well dot us well done. uh yeah uh pod dot us. Uh, tech pod not, dot us yes i'm not looking at the right part of our notes to actually know that because we're not there yet <laughs> um or twitter at high tech podcast um let us know if you don't agree with this but i think it's fair to say in online learning the temptation is an extreme focus on engagement with content. Um, and that, that I think, is partially because a lot of your content in your learning experience becomes a physical content space or a digital space. And so right. that becomes a lot of the focus. Um, but we need to encourage these other areas coming in. So I think ways I'm even thinking about this right now, like, okay, what does it look like for, you know, teaching presence? Well, one, uh, in online learning, this is why we encourage throughout the week, either in the beginning and even in the middle, like connecting with students through the digital platform that you're using um, to try to help set some of the direction for the week, maybe guide them in the way they're going to engage with some of the content or get into the discussion they're involved in midweek, um, right. not just after they're all done posting to kind of help set some, some uh, tone, the climate of the discussion, helping guide them to certain things, yep. regulating learning by helping them engage with certain elements of content, right? So like using those together, uh, the social engagement, this is a part where like, I think we struggle in online learning because we often try to just do it through discussions or like we create group work, but like, this is where you can, where stuff like Will and I have talked about before, like third spaces or doing video conferencing regularly through the week that requires students to work together. Slack or, and discord. Slack or discord. Um, like those things can help build some of that supporting discourse uh, that'll help lead towards a better educational experience. Thinking of ways to push them to do that. So maybe you're doing less reading that week and the amount of paper so that you can provide a little bit more time for them to actually engage with each other beyond just a post to this discussion once, reply twice by Sunday. Um, right. Like, you know, trying to create an environment where that discussion can happen. Um those are a few of the ideas that I know that we've tried before. I mean, this is why we encourage a lot of instructors to do regularly, not just give feedback, but uh, post stuff throughout the week, guide them throughout the week, because you're both setting the climate while it's happening and afterwards um, right. for every for every week, really, right. at the end of the day. One of the practical th comparisons I like to make 
about online education and this issue is when you look at your course page and the experiences or interactions you expect of your learners in a, in a, in a week's time, but across your entire course's time, is your course page and is everything set up more like a web page where somebody clicks on it and scrolls through it and clicks on it and scrolls through it and leaves? Or is it set up like social media where they come onto it, they have to read something, they might comment, they might not comment, they might like something, they might not like something, they might scroll some more, they might jump off, they're going to come back, they jump off, they're going to come back. You know, like it doesn't, I don't, I, I hate to say social media because I think so many folks are immediately like, oh, I don't want to teach the kids with Facebook or Twitter. No, no, no. It's, it's a functional approach. When you make a web page, right? Technically talking like business, I want people to get to my web page, find out what my product is, find out what my services are, fi find out something about me. And then maybe the call to action is to get a sales pitch, reach out to the company, get the address, go to wherever the product is at a, at a website level. Or if you're just reading news articles, right? Read the news article, leave. It's transactional. Show up, leave. Show up, leave. That's a web page. Social media is designed to keep you on the platform. Social media is designed to, to you go on to it, to use it, to interact with other people, to read what other people are doing, to submit your own thoughts for other people to hear. And I, I like that at a philosophical level, not necessarily Twitter, Facebook, the, the specific tools, but philosophically, a social media course page is more true to a community of inquiry framework than a web page philosophy is for, for a, an online course page. And most online course pages I, I've designed, participated yeah, I've designed, in. Seen. I built a layout that's basically a web page dynamic. And I don't know, it's difficult. I, I could see both sides of that where like, yeah. for because we've designed stuff like this. There's a side where, okay, yeah, I get that social component, um, uh, but also I need to make it easy for them to access the stuff they need to get to, and sometimes the social vibes of, like, like I'm thinking of, like, a lot of the LMSs out there, like Canvas and Schoology both fit into this category, have, like, right. a like an activity stream version right, of a homepage, right. um, and I think it's kind of what you're getting to, like, uh, sort of, uh, but that's part of the problem. No LMS that I've seen so far has a good solution to that. Right. Um, like I'd a lot like of their it to be kind of suck if I'm being honest. Um, oh, at amen. In, amen. In, encouraging and pushing out activity. So, okay. You know what? Real quick. Hot take. Uh, any LMS is listening to our podcast. I know there's tons of them. Um, if you're <laughs> right now, like, ah, oh, cool. All the, all the canvas people who are listening to us. Um, rubric guy. Yeah. Rubric, rubric guy. Mm. Um, if you don't know that joke, go listen to po past podcast episodes because that's why we have a website where you can find our past podcast episodes. <laughs> Will and I don't need to let you in on every inside joke that we make. Uh, so go check those out later. Uh, Rupert guys mentioned. Um, anyway, um, LMSs, if you're listening, if somebody can figure out a better social format to a course for their LMS, that would be fantastic. Will and I don't have the energy to build our own LMS. Um, I'm just going to be honest. That's not, that's not happening. Um, but uh, anybody listening, I would love to see a, a solution to that. Um, because to what you're talking about, Will, it'd be interesting if you built, what would it look like to build a course where it's encouraging commenting and engaging on weekly things that you're doing? Right. Or, like, almo or almost anything like, like why doesn't yes, everything well, that's what I mean. comments? Like what if, what if, Let's just, let's dream up a world. There's an idea spawning right now. Okay. Let's, let's dream up a world. Okay. <laughs> Where we remove the horrible discussion system in LMSs. Okay. We don't have to Love delete it. it. It's fine. Canvas, you can keep it. We're just not going to use it. Okay. Will and I are not using it. We're moving it. We're going to hide it. We're relegating it to a different place. Um, it's probably rubric guy's basement. Okay. <laughs> it's going there um, along with uh, some of the other, uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, it's, it's just going there. Okay. Um, so we're removing that. And instead what we have is each week you're required to engage at a, at a certain number or level with things that the other students are doing in the course, right? Like what would it look like to do something like that? Where like your assignments meet into a collaborative uh, so social presence idea where you have to actually get, engage with each other on stuff that they're doing a weekly basis. Now, some of you are going, what would that look like? I don't know. 
Will and I are blue skying right now. Stop raining on my parade. Whoever's listening to this podcast saying that. Okay. Uh, bring an umbrella to a brainstorm. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, I think there's a lot of difficulties with it, but there's something to this idea of what if engagement with each other as the learners and the instructor was a we- was a weekly framework that tied into the rest of what you were doing instead of like a specific activity. You know yeah. what I mean? Because that's really at the end of the day what social media is. I mean, social media, it's not like, a, oh, here, I'm going to go on Facebook and type up this this uh, thing over here um and uh post it but nobody's gonna comment on that because i didn't ask them to like it's it's social media it's like everything i'm doing is social it's interaction it's it's built around that system what would it look like to build a learning environment that's kind of that way like basically right. like you're doing things you know you're you're watching videos you're you know posting papers you're doing you're doing whatever but there's some kind of expectation for the amount of engagement you do with each other's stuff um that you're doing throughout the week and and that's one of those things where I agree with you, like what you said before about Canvas and Schoology. I, we know that those two t- platforms have built like an activity stream or an updates page, something that tries to keep yeah. kind of a, a scroll flow. Google Classroom is fairly well built that way too. But I think one of the things that Google Classroom does benefit from is like almost anything that's in the central stream of materials or quizzes or whatever can be commented on. So it's, yes. it's actually, it does, Google Classroom doesn't have some of the more organizational structures. In my experience, I haven't used it in a lot recently. I just tried to pull up a test and it's not really uh, useful unless I build the test out. Um, but like, Schoology has a materials page. Canvas not only has each of your pages like discussion, assignment, files, or whatever, but you can have your modules page where you can build everything out in some sort of sequential format. Google Classroom is just this like solid feed, top to bottom, and everything kind of operates that way. When I've used it, it can feel clunky, but I think it might be the closest thing to what we're dreaming. Like it might be Maybe. on the way. Yeah, I'm. Get. I'm like a. Ma- I don't know what I'm imagining yet. I'm almost imagining like an LMS meets perusal. Okay, Ooh. like something you can annotate basically everything. I, I don't. I don't know. Yes. There's. There's some like. There's this. There's this idea forming in my head, of what yes. it could look like. And as a professor, I could see the amount of engagement each student is doing, right, right. with each other. Like so that right. I can in some way hold students accountable and create that climate of, you know, engagement. I, I don't know. I'm not there yet. I don't have a perfect solution. I know there's a couple different people. There's an LMS we mentioned here a couple times, Pathright that we know of. Um, I know they kind of have like a, dis- I haven't looked at it in a while, but they had kind of like a long standing discussion thing that was like okay. embedded into the course um, that did discussions differently. I'd have to look back at that and see if that's anything like what we're talking about. I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but there's, I don't know, there's something there. You know what I mean? If we've learned anything well, from, from this, this discussion, I feel like the social side is the side we need to work on a little bit for both the right, professors and each right. other. At the end of the day, we need a better system for instructors and other students to engage with each other in online courses while doing that's, the, the cognitive. That's stuff. not just an activity that week, but like is engaged with the other cognitive things that they're working on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah and, and it's like, yeah it's fun to talk this through because we're really trying to visualize this. And I think that one of the best ways to visualize brainstorming is with tools like yeah. Visme. I don't, I just really, that was, I, was, I, was, I wasn't sure I was, how you were getting, you know, I, I know. like, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you're going to be like, you know, I like me myself, I like to visualize things, you know, I, I, um, I, I, vis- I wasn't sure I if you were going there. I, I couldn't I couldn't yeah, I, I want couldn't there, there, there to be something corny there and a good joke and a good transition unfortunately we didn't get there sorry this means we tried shit. we yeah we yeah. didn't get to a good transition um but the tool this week is Visme. This is a double decker episode. I brought COI to the table and then I brought Visme to the table. I used this back at one of my last institutions for a minute. And then they actually, I think, found me on Twitter again. And we, we started kind of talking and, and seeing what the product was like. Um, Visme is a Canva competitor. I, I couldn't really think of the right. Like, yeah. What, how are we not going to say that? Um, I'm, listen, tool? I'm just a... going to be real here. Um, <laughs> I opened it up and I was like, oh, hello, uh, Canva interface. Um, like, right. and, uh, but to Visme's defense, um, it's not like Canva's interface is revolutionary. Listen, I love no, Canva, but no, it's no, like, no. that's a sidebar. 
with a, a bunch of stuff. It's it, it, like I just, they, I just it, don't to their know. Defense, they went to the classic. Don't make me think principle that I pick up from that book all the time, which is like <laughs> if it works and it's a use common it. interface, just use it. Yeah. Um. Like so. Hey, props to you. Uh, you went with that principle, and it was easy for me as somebody who uses Canva a lot to figure out where to just go. Start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I, th the thing I like, I wrestle with when we talk about apps. Like we talk about apps every week, every every episode. But yeah. like, you know, Slack, Discord, these are like chat apps. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit. Those are those yeah. are social media apps. Like, I just don't know what this genre is. Content creation. I maybe. I've, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've always put them. Yeah, in like image media creation. I mean, that's that's kind of like Canva, Adobe. Um, right. Like that's that's what they Adobe are Spark. for. Yeah. Adobe Spark. Um, this is me I would put in that category. Yeah, there's like there's a you know, it's basically visual media. Designing. So so it's a studio. In yeah, fact, I think that's the category. Studio. Yeah. In fact, I think that's the category that we use in our external tool database in our at my work that categorizes all tools. You know what just got um, me though? What? V Vizme. Uh, now I want to know. Now we're gonna have to ask them. Vizme? is probably short for visual media that just if it's not sense. i'm gonna be a little disappointed i'm gonna be honest <laughs> this me when will asks you this i'm assuming you're gonna listen to this episode uh because we've been talking to them about this um this me when you're listening to this if it's not if it doesn't stand for visual media can you lie to will <laughs> just like can you tell us that it does that would That's amazing. that would be fine um That's, yeah so i mean I like this me at its base right is so well, Will and I will be transparent here. Viz, so Will connected with Vizme. Vizme reached out to us. Um, I forget how it all went down. We got we got a pro account um, from Vizme. So Will and I are reviewing this as a podcast who has been given a free pro account to review their app. Okay, for the time, right, right. Like I don't, yeah, I don't for the time, forever. But like, yeah. So it, it's it's although that would be cool, Vizme, if you're listening, tool. just don't deactivate it. That would be super fun. <laughs> Um, they are going to listen, my friend. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I know they're probably going to listen. That's why I'm talking to them. Visme is the third person in this conversation right now. I don't know who from Visme is listening, but if you're listening, you know, just leave it on. It's fine. You don't need to turn that off. <laughs> what, what it can do. So we'll set, we'll yeah. set that down. And for folks like, you know, okay. Most people know what Canva is. Most people know what visual media studios are that we've described that generally, but can't, uh, Visme they, specifically. We didn't get there quickly on our own. <laughs> we That's didn't. all I'm we saying. <laughs> Visme can make graphics from, uh, still images like JPEGs and PNGs to, to GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you like to pronounce that graphical image format. It's, it's a GIF. Um, if you say it another way, you're probably a serial killer. I agree um. with you. I agree with you. <laughs> Uh, you, you can you can actually like export videos and create videos and stuff like that. Now the free uh, edition I think is limited in like the me media types you can export. Yeah. And then there's there's tiers to the pricing that like, mm -hmm. you know, it's freemium. Everything's limited. Yeah. Um, which again to there we've said this about Canva. We've said it about other softwares. The the amount of what you get out of it, we need to stop being greedy too in education and realize like these people right. need to make money to keep their companies running. So like. Right. It's, we want the lights on. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the only thing like we'll just, we'll get it out of the way in the beginning is um, I do think their pricing could be better. That's my, my comment on Visme. Um, that. Yeah. It's, it's only more because their starter method only lets you download JPEGs, PNGs, and PDFs. Um, right. So that's, that's a difficulty. That right. said, um, I think they have a lot of cool features. I think their interface is, is good. I think it's easy to move around. And thankfully they do have like a Visme for education page. Yes. Um, some platforms put that Visme for education page and just say, give me your at L get at something dot edu webs, you know, uh, address and we'll give it to you for free. There says contact us, right? So reach out yeah. to Visme, um, you know, see what kind of education resources they'll provide. Maybe it's cheaper. Maybe it's free. We love that. If it is, I don't know. But the platform has a lot of media in it that really surprised me. Like I, I've loved just kind of sifting through the templates, sifting through the image imagery that they provide, even videos. Their videos, their stock footage videos, some of them are like three second clips, five second clips, seven second clips. They're awesome. There is frankly a lot of representation. I appreciate that. The imagery is of people of different genders, identities, um, racial backgrounds, you know, 
physical and visual presentations. Like there's folks in these videos that have colored hair. That is a great thing. You know, there's a lot of these kind of stock images things out there that are all buttoned up suits and ties and everybody's like one kind of look like you can find a video a stock video uh, in this platform for almost any of your purposes whether it's a professional yeah. a classroom even just doing something funny for somebody's birthday you know because you could use VizMe to make any kind of graphic um there's like a content calendar and some features to control your brand. So if you have like, if you're working in this platform with a brand and brand colors, you can do assets, brand assets, you can create styles and templates so that it's easier to make, you know, reproducible things. I know Josh and I would definitely use that for the podcast, right? Like you do, mm-hmm. and <laughs> you do do that in another platform. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, add in our logo, add in our colors, and it yeah. makes it easier to make every single post. Like They, they have stuff that. I'd be looking for. At the end of the day, they, uh, I'm not going to be around the bush. They, their competitor is Canva at the end of the day. Um, and they have the stuff I'd be looking for that Canva also has. Like they have brand right. brand right. stuff. So I think that's important. I think to their credit, I put them in the same category. I put Canva in, which is like, I, I don't know if this is how they spawned. I hope it is as a company. Um, but they looked at Adobe and went, that's cool. That's super annoying to use. Could we <laughs> make it easier? Um, Let's make like, it a so lot easier. I like it. Um, I to comment about your video thing. So again, folks, we on the podcast, especially myself, are very experienced using Canva. I use it all the time for what we do on the podcast and at work. Um, their video stuff is better. I will say they have better uh, template video things. Canva, honestly, I didn't even realize they had that until we were comparing this tool and Canva. I'm looking at this. Um, I was so like, excited I, about these videos. He's like, I don't know if that has it. Like, does that have it? Um, I do think their video footage stuff is better. Um, and I really like their um, their charts and stuff that you put in. Like, Canva has some of that stuff too, but I, I like Vizme has yeah. uh, a couple different options that I really like. Um, and I will Even say, like I, stuff. yeah, I really dig that uh, their graphics area. So, like, if you've never used any of these tools, the thing I use all the time is, like, I'm creating slides or things like that and i need like a graphic not not a legitimate picture but like a uh you know cartoon graphic of a person or uh pizza i don't know why i would need a pizza that's just on the screen that's what popped up in my head yeah um pizza like i just uh, you know to to look behind the curtain just this week i uh was getting our episode page ready and i needed something about communication so i needed like an icon of people talking um and uh so like what i really like about vizme is when I click on their graphics thing, they give me several options first. Like, do I want wireframes? Do I want characters? Do I want icons? Uh, if we're just comparing, Canva doesn't do that. I will say one of my frustrations with Canva is their graphics section kind of becomes, uh, my computer just starts slowing down because it's like everything is popping up on the side screen. Um, <laughs> so I really dig that. And that might also be why uh, just initial feedback on Vizme, uh, they're, they uh they're like lag and uh the the tasking on my computer is not uh as bad as canva i will say in the recent couple months i've been using canva canva's been getting worse at this uh i've been having some problems with it so um Bummer. so i will say positive towards visme that that seems to be working better i also don't know if that's just because i don't have as much stuff in visme <laughs> do in canva uh, i i don't know but i'm i'm really enjoying just as a, a cute quick feature like they have a little spot like you were saying about diagrams i can click on countries like this actually drives me nuts about like creating geographical media okay i like geography to be accurate if i'm taking the effort to put in an image or a cutout or a diagram of a country a state a region or whatever i want it to be accurate they have a full generator so if i i can just literally click on the world and it gives me like what area of the world do I want to be the center of the diagram? And like, what are there any countries I want to not show? I can search and just literally be like, Hey, uh, I want to put in a, a, a a PNG image, like a, a reusable little image of Chile. I can click on Chile and it inserts it on the screen. That is, that's pretty cool. You know, just, just from like a geography purpose, like I can get photo real, uh, photo accurate, representations of every country in the world they've got this little thing figured out so that's pretty cool uh, other feature bonus for viz me um and i'm going to stop mentioning the other competitor because i feel like i'm I, I love both of them so i'm not going to mention it 
Um, I will say somebody I know uh, somewhere uh, as a tool uh, doesn't have the ability to annotate directly on images with comments. So like if Will and I are collaborating, a lot of these tools, oh. like so Disney has team features. Um, so if you're working with a team on this stuff, um, like for instance, if you're working in like offices like Will and I work on where you're designing courses, like right. a lot of times you have this type of tool or Canva or something else to do graphic creation for stuff, infographics for courses, things like that. And a lot of times team members have to collaborate on that stuff. Um, you can comment directly on a place on an image. Like I can comment on this lamp uh, on this photo I'm looking at right now and add a comment and I could at mention will and say like, could we not have a lamp? You know, like things like that. Um, I want the lamp. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. That's a strong opinion. I feel like, um, but uh, so I will say another one that I know that might have canvas, but like without the S um, uh, does not, it, uh, whatever. Canva does not have that. Uh, and I yeah. will be honest. I love Canva. Uh, and that drives me nuts. It is so annoying to collaborate comment wise uh, on stuff. I was just doing it today on a presentation uh, that we had to do for a, a kickoff and meeting. You couldn't. <laughs> and I, and it was difficult. It was trying to figure out where that you have to describe in the comment where I'm talking about on the photo. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. That's not that hard, but it's super annoying. It's a lot easier just to click on the part of the photo and let that comment be there. So anyway, that drives me nuts uh, that I can't do that in that tool. And I really dig that I can do that here in Visme. So huge props to Visme. Yeah. yeah. All right, folks, you know, like we said, it's a freemium platform, so you can get started. You can check it out. We yeah. don't know what the education platform and pricing is, but we th we think that this is working, and it's and it's really um, got some top-notch features, so give it a shot. Go, go yeah. over to vizme.co is their website. Um, this is not a sponsored episode. We've taken we've taken this we've treated this more like a sponsored episode, whatever. Like this, this is just us doing our usual thing. Yeah. Um, We've looked at tons of platforms and their competitors in the past for episodes. So we just adding this into the, the list of them. Yeah. We'll definitely be continuing to keep our eye on this one and let us know if you use VizMe. Uh, Canva has education. I mean, it's just like it, they're all yeah. over my Twitter. Every Twitter user in K-12 uses Canva. But VizMe has a fully I'm always, ready platform. I'm always up for competitors in areas because it also makes each other better. If Canva starts to yes. own the platform a little too much... They get yep. the, the uh, what I call the Adobe complex where uh, they oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever they want. Listen, I love Adobe stuff, but I know for a fact an Adobe person basically told somebody in our institution, good luck finding another solution for this uh, when they were trying to negotiate pricing. Like, yep. so like that's, that's not ever good for the market. So I like that. I Yes, it's not a sponsorship episode. My honest opinion is this. I really like Visme. I think it's a cool tool. Um, Visme, I do think you need to work on your pricing if you're going to compete with the other side. With, especially just, with education. That's, that's Those just prices my, don't yeah. roll with education. The, that's just my opinion. Um, yeah. But I think it's a great tool. So if you're looking for a visual media tool like this and you're like, I'm not sure I want to go to Canva. Like everybody's doing Canva, but like, is that where I want to go? Um, or you need the social annotation features. You yes, need to be able or you need the social annotation feature. Or you want me better media or... Um, you want some of that stuff? I think Visme might be an option that's worth checking it out for you. Or that... I will I will comment to this: if you're more comfortable with PowerPoint as like slides oh, yeah. and stuff, Visme's inter slides interface and stuff is a lot more like PowerPoint. Um, so I will say that part might be easier for you to get used to. I know Canva can kind of be a struggle for people at times because it's not like PowerPoint, so it, it yeah. takes some time to get used to. The way you edit slides and do stuff is a lot similar to is a lot more similar to PowerPoint than it is to what canva does so um i do think that's that's nice that's a, a nice feature for it so and last point as you're just talking to the came i was like oh the social annotation stuff can't commenting on pictures while you're working on them that's that's perfect for a classroom you you need that if you want to have students yeah. do critiques and stuff of their work while they're making mm -hmm. media and whatever boom big big win there for students and teachers yeah. so this might uh, be easier for some but... of the collaboration stuff for students to be honest so um, I think that's a, if you're looking for something like that, Visme might be what you want to look at. So, um, anyway, with that said, that is the end of season three. It's but here, no. Will. It's arrived. It's fully arrived. The Titanic just hit the, hit the, uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I can't, I, the, the iceberg. Uh, there and in case you were curious, the woman's name was Rose. We bought a full <laughs> round, full round. 
That's why you needed to listen to the whole episode, folks. So yeah. you could remember listen to the whole, listen to the whole episode. Anyway, uh, season four. So a couple things. One, um, the next episode, episode 100, is not coming next week. Um, we are, we're taking a little bit of a break. Uh, we will not be kicking off season four until uh, May 23rd. So, 2023. Uh, yeah, 2023. So we're got a couple weeks off. If you're new to the High Tech Podcast, it gives you plenty of time to go listen to our other episodes. Because we've Go got start. 99 of them. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, so, well, a little bit over, depending on your debate about our episode numbers. Um, but uh, 99 for the most part uh, episodes. So you can go check those out if you haven't listened to those. Uh, but on May 23rd, season four will kick off. And Will and I are not going to tell you what the kickoff to season four is going to be. But I will say this, okay? It's going to be different. Okay. <laughs> It is. Will yes. and I have not done this yet, uh, but this will be a whole week event um, at the High Tech Podcast. Uh, we have a ton of people set up to talk on the first episode, um, and there'll be some tutorial stuff I think that we're releasing during this week as well. Um, so it'll be super cool. It's going to be a whole kickoff for uh, season four because it's our hundredth episode. So we wanted to have some fun with it. Um, so and exciting stuff to come for the new year uh, for the high tech podcast. So uh, a new year. We're not a new year. New season. New season. It's a new year for the high tech podcast. Guess what? Yes. The new year now starts in May for us. The high tech new year. <laughs> high tech new year. That's going to be a celebration. Anyway, so May 23rd, episode 100, season four will kick off. So uh, we will miss you for the couple weeks uh, that uh, we're not here. Don't worry, Will and I will just be sitting in a room crying until the next episode comes out. Um, you know, but uh, season four kicks off that day. Looking forward to it. Again, just a reminder: you can find us on Twitter at High Tech Podcast. Hit us up on Twitter. Uh, mention if you got apps or you're from an app company. You want to talk to us about being on the podcast, or you have something you want to talk about being on the podcast. Hit us up on Twitter. We love doing that. Um, or email us at inbox at hightechpod.us or uh, check out our website hightechpod.us. Uh, episode pages have information about all the apps that we do and all the stuff we talk about. Um, so it's super fun. Go check those out. Um, again, thank you for joining us for another week as we continue to learn what it looks like to harness technology in the classroom, whether online or in person until May. See ya. See ya.